Dunham has been a broadcaster and a reporter in Alaska for the past 50 years, winning numerous awards, including the Alaska Press Club's Howard Rock Tom Snap First Amendment Prize of 2017. Now retired in January, he has been uh, at the Anchorage Daily News and Alaska Dispatch News, often included historical articles in Genesis of two new books on the acquisition of Russian America by the United States in 1867. He previously contributed to Reason and Orion magazine, but is the editor of a grammar of Central Alaskan Yukon. So without further ado, thank you, Michael Dunham. <laughs> Before we get started, this is a little custom I've come up with with these little speeches. Um, I'm interested in having everybody just kind of wave their hands. These are greetings to the Seward House Museum in Auburn, Washington from Alaska. So Alaska says hi to Mr. Seward is what we're doing there. All of that. And I think, you know, since Seward spoke here, they're, well, they'd better be interested. It, it, it's interesting to visit Southeast. I was, uh, yeah, in the, the, the Central Yupik Grammar is a long labor of love, but that's not really what I'm here to talk about. But I was struck today while I was at the airport, uh, a family was coming through the door with boxes and children and everything, and I held the door open for them, and the last woman through says, Gunnel Sheesh. And uh, my response was, E. <laughs> so uh, you just kind of fall back on things from time to time. Um, anyway, this, um, I call this talk, The Four Emancipators. Um, for reasons that will become clear, it's drawn from my two books, The Man Who Sold Alaska, a short biography of Alexander II, Tsar of Russia, and The Man Who Bought Alaska, a short bi biography of William Seward. And the emphasis here is on short. The Seward biography, for instance, takes up less pages than the speech that Charles Sumner gave on the floor of the Senate advocating the purchase of Alaska. <coughs> so, our first emancipator, William H. Seward. Uh, is everyone able to hear me okay? okay. Yeah, William H. Seward, uh, born in 1801. He was born in Florida, Florida, New York, a little town close to the big city. Florida was not part of the United States in those days. His family owned six or seven slaves, which was not uncommon for the better off New Yorkers of that era. On paper, at least, uh, North America was divided between Spain, Britain, and 16 independent but united states. And then way off in the northwest corner, somewhere there, uh, Russia had a few trading posts. Seward studied law, and then he moved to Auburn, New York, which had a big prison, good place if you're a lawyer, and also was the hometown of his sweetheart, Frances Miller. She was the daughter of a wealthy judge. Judge Miller agreed to the marriage as long as Seward and Francis agreed to live in his house, which is today the Seward House Museum there in Auburn. There's a photo of it about a year ago. Uh, put it on your bucket list. Seward's passion was politics. He uh, was elected to the New York State Legislature at the age of 29 and then elected governor at the age of 37. That's a picture of him as the handsome young governor. He supported immigration, prison reform, and legal rights for blacks. By this time, his father's own slaves had either been freed or were dead, although they continued to live with the family for some time afterwards. Both Seward and uh, Francis opposed slavery. They used part of the uh, basement in Judge Miller's house to hide people escaping to Canada on the Underground Railroad. Here's a picture of that room where they were hidden out until they could make it across the Great Lakes into Canada. Here's friends of Harriet Tubman, who happens to be buried a short distance from where he's buried loaned her money for her various enterprises, purchased property down the block from his house later on. Um, he served three years as governor and then went back to lawyering and became rich as a patent attorney. His clients included people like Samuel Norse, uh, Morse, the inventor of the telegraph. Uh, but his most famous case involved the pro bono defense of a black man, William Freeman. Freeman had gone deaf and insane from multiple beatings while in prison. When he was released, he murdered a white family there in Auburn. The city wanted to string him up, the good citizens wanted to string him up, and no lawyer could be found to defend him until Seward spoke up and said, I will be the counsel for the defense until his death. Um, Seward argued with a very elaborate and expensive case that no white man in Freeman's condition would ever be on trial for his life, and Freeman deserted, deserved to be treated the same. I am not the counsel for the accused, he said. 
I am the counsel for humanity. It was the first insanity defense to be brought in the United States, maybe in the world. He lost the case, but it made him famous and helped boost him into the U.S. Senate. There he is as a senator. In Washington, he took the lead in arguing for territorial expansion and against the expansion of slavery. And as the election of 1860 approached, he assumed that he would be the presidential candidate for the new Republican Party, which he had helped to found. Instead, the convention went with a uh, country lawyer from Illinois. Seward was crushed, but not for long. His friends convinced him that he and Lincoln saw eye to eye on important matters and that Lincoln needed Seward's help to get elected. Seward went on the campaign trail and made speech after Stemwinder speech. Lincoln won with 39.8% of the vote. It's pretty certain he couldn't have done it without Seward's help, and he made Seward his Secretary of State. Uh, various scholars will tell you that Seward saved the United States of America about three times during the Civil War era, <clears throat> notably, uh, most notably in the Trent Crisis, when Britain came literally within hours of declaring war on the United States. If they'd done that, the South could have held its own, we would be a very different country. Historian Walter Starr calls it the Cuban Missile Crisis of the eight, 19th century. Seward was able to resolve that crisis almost single-handedly, with very little help from anybody. Uh, but it was, a, it was a, a sweat for him, and the fear continued that the European powers would become involved on the side of the South somehow or other, and there was no way the United States could both fight a war and hold off the British Navy. It wasn't going to happen. But then, as, as if by magic, unannounced, two fleets of Russian warships appeared simultaneously in San Francisco and New York. Um, Seward, it was sort of a goodwill tour to their American friends. And Seward hosted all of the officers, one of his fabulous parties. He was famous for his fabulous parties, by the way. Uh, put him in debt more than once. But uh, it was a clear signal to any outside country thinking of getting involved in America's little squabble that if they did so, they might have to deal with the navy of our second emancipator, Alexander II, czar, emperor, and autocrat of all the Russias, including what we now call Alaska. He was born in 1818, and his family, like Seward's, owned slaves, about 20 million of them. Now, there are some differences between Russian serfdom and American slavery, but at the bottom line, both were property. They, could, they were used as forced labor. They could be sold, raped, beaten by their masters. Alexander's father, Nicholas I, was one of the most suspicious, iron-fisted, totalitarian rulers ever anywhere. He could have given Stalin a run for his money. But he saw to it that his son got a first-class education. And when he came of age, Tsarevich Alexander was sent off to Europe to find a wife of suitable rank. He made it as far as England, where he was smitten by Queen Victoria. And she was smitten by him. I'm really quite in love with the Grand Duke, she wrote in her diary. The British politicians were mortified. And so was Nicholas, who put a kibosh on the whole romance. Alexander came home settling for Maximiliana Wilhelmina Augusta Sophie, a German princess who became plain old Tsarina Maria. Uh, by the way, this is her in later life. She was much cuter as an 18-year-old. This is after she had had six children and was quite ill and made me more than a little bit fed up with life in the royal palace. Uh, Tsar Nicholas I is best known for the Crimean War, in which Britain and France joined with Turkey against Russia. Now, Nicholas was opposed to anything modern, like those steamships. Uh, the last naval battle of just sailing ships was fought at the beginning of the Crimean War between Turkey and Russia. His army was fighting with the same blunderbusses they'd used against Napoleon 30 years before. Uh, meanwhile, the Allies had the latest big guns, fresh from the Krupp factory in Germany, and smashed the Russian stronghold of Sevastopol, shown here, into rubble. At which point, Nicholas went to bed and died. Alexander was now the Tsar. There's his coronation. Would have liked to get an invitation to that, except I understand it was really hot in Moscow that particular August. His number one task was to stop the war. The peace treaty he had to sign was humiliating, but not as bad as it might have been. Russia got to keep the Crimea, for instance, and Sevastopol, and the treaty said nothing about Turkey's allies in the Caucasus, which Russia had been trying to conquer for decades. This is the same region that has Chechnya, Dagestan, uh, still trouble spots in the, 
the contemporary world. But the toughest resistance came from the Muslim tribesmen in Circassia, a mountainous region led by Imam Shamil, shown here. Alexander used a scorched earth policy, deporting or killing every man, woman, and child that he could get to. And the Circassian campaign can only be described as genocide. And yet, Alexander is not remembered as Alexander the Exterminator. Instead, he's praised by posterity for his reforms. Early in his reign, he expanded freedom of speech and the press. He reformed the military, the clergy, the education, and the legal systems. The legal system was a real mess. That was some major, major heavy lifting. He allowed Jews to serve in the government and to live where they wished. And the word perestroika came into vogue. But the thing that has brought him everlasting glory was his liberation of the serfs in 1861. He told his nobles the present system of owning human souls cannot be allowed to continue. The Emancipation Manifesto was a long and convoluted document that didn't quite work as advertised. Freedom was not instantaneous and the peasants had to buy their land back from owners at inflated prices. The process was so burdensome that serfs actually rioted and had to be put down with military force. Nevertheless, to this day, this czar is known as Alexander the Liberator. What Russians try not to remember is that he gave away their country's North American uh, colony. With the Louisiana Purchase and the Mexican Cession, America's population had stretched across the continent, and now we had people living on the West Coast, with ever-increasing trade with Asia. Russia also had new settlements on its East Coast, Nikolaevsk and Vladivostok both of which were established with the assistance of settlers from Sitka, by the way. The Tsar's brother, Nicholas, thought that Russian America was a liability, a drain on resources that would be better used in Siberia. He sent a commission to Sitka to dig up dirt, but the commission found the company's books in pretty good order, the colony making something like a profit, and the population well treated by Russian standards. The Tsar prepared to extend the Russian-American company's charter for another 20 years. Um, Herb Hope, the late uh, former one-time president of the Alaska Native Brotherhood, <clears throat> once told me, um, we didn't worry too much about the Russians. There weren't that many of them, and they were scared of Indians with guns. One place that the Russians were particularly afraid of was here, Klukwan, north of modern-day Haines, on the Chilkat River. The Chilkats controlled the key pass between the coast and today's Yukon Territory. It was a trading monopoly. They were anxious to keep it. So when the Hudson's Bay Company built Fort Selkirk at the confluence of the Pelly and Yukon Rivers, it was seen as a direct economic threat. A Klukwan leader named Koshuks, or uh, Shot Ridge, among other names, led a party hundreds of miles inland and burned Fort Selkirk to the foundations. There the foundations are being excavated by Parks Canada about 10 years ago. Uh, Fort Selkirk was not rebuilt for another 40 years and put in a different location. Kokluk. The family told me to say it that way. <clears throat> Our emancipator number three, born in 1817, and yes, he was born into a slave-owning family. Slaves were as much a part of Alaska society as they were for most of the world for most of human history. Kokluk was uh, regarded with some justification as the most ferocious leader of the most ferocious tribe in Alaska. But as we shall see, fighting was not his only skill. If you really want to think about who was the most ferocious leader of the most ferocious tribe in Alaska, it was probably this man, Jefferson Davis. And as you all know in Sitka, and even Alaskans are baffled by it, not that Jefferson Davis. Not the president of the Confederacy, but this man, Jefferson Columbus Davis, an Indiana farm boy who had grown up with dreams of being an Arctic explorer, but when the Mexican War broke out, he enlisted as a private, he, uh, was uh, given commendations on the battlefield in the Battle of Buena Vista, <clears throat> and by the 1850s, he was an artillery officer assigned to Fort Moultrie in Charleston, South Carolina. Davis was single, dashing, and a Democrat, important in South Carolina. A pro-Union Democrat, true, but certainly not one of them abolitionists. He was very popular with the gentry of Charleston and with their eligible daughters. But when, with the election of Abraham Lincoln, things got tense. For safety, the Fort Moultrie detachment was moved to Fort Sumpner, a still incomplete island fortification in the middle of Charleston Harbor. Davis was the last man to leave Fort Moultrie. And when the shore batteries began shelling Fort Sumpter, 
in April of 1861, Lieutenant Davis loaded his cannons and shot back in the first exchange of fire in the Civil War. He rose quickly through the Union ranks. He was a rarity in the Northern Army. A, um, an officer who had actually begun as an enlisted man and furthermore had real combat experience, which most of them didn't. By the end of 1862, he himself was a general under the command of General Bull Nelson in Kentucky. And William Nelson was in fact a bully. He belittled Davis, who went to him demanding an apology. Nelson refused, and uh, Jeff Davis shot Bull Nelson dead. Sherman, General Sherman got him off the hook, <clears throat> and eventually assigned him to guard his rear on the march through Georgia. By that time, Abraham Lincoln had issued the Emancipation Proclamation freeing slaves in rebel-held territory, uh, two years after Alexander had proclaimed his Emancipation Manifesto. This picture shows Lincoln reading the draft of his Emancipation Proclamation to his cabinet. I want you to notice how all eyes are looking at Seward, uh, except for the Secretary of Interior and the Postmaster General, who apparently have other thoughts in their minds, but the Secretary of War and Treasury, Navy, and the Attorney General, and Lincoln are all looking at Seward, who is kind of staring into space and doing some kind of... Uh, he made several edits to... Uh, he, he was Lincoln's closest confidant and advisor in Washington, D.C. He made several edits and helped write many of Lincoln's most famous speeches and uh, heavily worked on co-editing the Emancipation Proclamation. He also took the lead in the efforts to pass the 13th Amendment, which eventually banned slavery throughout the country. The Emancipation Proclamation may have been good politics for Lincoln, but it was a pain in the butt for Sherman. As his men marched through Georgia, they were joined by throngs of jubilant, jubilant slaves leaving the plantations as they passed and eventually becoming quite a drain on the army. They were free, they knew they were free, but they weren't exactly sure what that meant. Um, the whole thing came to a head at a place called Ebenezer Creek, a very steep defile with a single bridge going across it. Um, Sherman's army was being pursued at that point by fighting Joe Wheeler, the South's best cavalryman. Sherman got his men across and had uh, Davis hold the rear. When Sherman's army was safely on the other side, Wheeler closed in. There's Joe Wheeler, the short man, the shortest man buried at Arlington, by the way, in the Spanish-American War in the uniform of a damn Yankee. Um, two of his lieutenants there, one is, um, one is Leonard Wood in the middle, and then Lieutenant Colonel Theodore Roosevelt. In his later years, uh, Wheeler liked to style himself as the conqueror of Cuba. Anyway, back in 1863, he was charging down uh, Davis's neck. Davis got his men across the bridge and then blew it up leaving the blacks on the other side for Wheeler to sort out and get back to their plantations. Word of the Ebenezer Creek incident reached the northern press and it set off a furor. When Sherman reached Savannah, he was met on the docks by none other than the Secretary of War himself, Edwin Stanton. Stanton demanded that Davis be turned over in chains for court-martial. Sherman refused. He said, I'm trying to fight a war, not run a charity. And Stanton had to back down which he did not do very often, and he certainly did not do very graciously. The, um, as the war was coming to an end, Seward took a tumble from this carriage. He, um, he, he, he suffered a concussion, a broken shoulder, and a broken jaw. He was still bedbound when the war came to an end. On the night of April 14, 1865, possibly the most tragic night in American history, a big stranger came into the Seward house. He bludgeoned Seward's son Frederick with a pistol that had misfired and then pushed his way into the sick room where he stabbed Seward several times with a knife. An army nurse and Seward's oldest son, Augustus, finally wrestled him out. Seward's wounds were extremely serious and those of Frederick were even worse. Miraculously, they both survived. His wife did not. She was already in bad health and the stress of this put her, uh, she was dead in 30 days. A few days after the attack, Seward regained consciousness enough to be asked to be moved to a window. As he looked out the window on Washington, D.C., he saw all the flags at half-mast, and he reached the conclusion that no one had been willing to tell him about. He said, the president is dead. And then he rolled over and began to cry. The man who tried to kill Seward, Lewis Payne, also known as Leward Powell, was an accomplice of John Wilkes Booth. 
Booth's plan had been to kill Lincoln, Seward, Vice President Johnson, and General Grant all at once. That plan mostly failed, but we all know how tragically successful the successful part was. It was a bloody time, bloody time for Koshluks as well. Three high-ranking uh, Chilkats were killed by members of the Sitka tribe. Justice demanded a life for the life, but the Russian garrison here in Sitka prevented a retaliatory raid. And it was a horrible year for Alexander. The emancipation had not gone smoothly. Landowners in Poland, which is part of his empire, hated it. They joined students in a rebellion, which was suppressed by the Russian uh, army with overwhelming force. Hundreds of Poles were executed. Tens of thousands were sent into exile. But in another part of the uh, empire, the Tsar gave a constitution and political rights to the Finns. While he remained the absolute dictator in Russia, he became the constitutional monarch in Finland. It's first. Here's the statue. Actually, it's only. It's only. Uh, here's the statue of him in um, Helsinki Square, where he is still known as Alexander the Liberator, or the Good Tsar. This is to discriminate him from all the other Tsars. Um, adding to his grief at, in 1865 was the death of his oldest son from tuberculosis. Nicholas, the heir to the throne, was considered intellectually brilliant, humane, a born leader with all the ideal qualities of a great future czar. Russia looked bright with this man coming to the throne. His death left Alexander with four other sons, Shemp, Larry Joe, uh, Mo, and um, anyway. The second one from the bottom there, Ele the future Alexander III, was considered to be a soft-hearted, soft-headed, lovable bumpkin. He almost came to the throne ahead of his time when uh, a university dropout tried to shoot the czar. Booth started something that had not existed prior to this point, the idea of trying to kill a monarch not to replace, or a leader, not to replace him with someone else, but just to uh, get rid of him. And it's the kind of the, the whole stem of modern terrorism of just creating chaos by taking out a person. Um, starts with John Wilkes Booth in a very interesting way. There are many assassination attempts and assassinations in Europe and America uh, following him. Um, now, talk of ceding the Russian properties in North America to the United States had been going on for 30 years. It went all the way back to the Jackson administration. But with the uh, length of time it took to get a communication from St. Petersburg to Washington, D.C. and back, it just never got very far. By the time one side had made an offer uh, and got back to the other side, you get cold feet over here. I mean, it was, you know, politics was changing all the time. In 1866, the transatlantic cable was finally established, and Seward wrote to his daughter, I wonder how this is going to affect my way of doing business. It probably is one of the things that made the purchase of Alaska possible. You could get a decision within 24 hours, 48 hours, uh, whereas before it would have taken, it just wouldn't have happened. The, um, most of Alexander's advisors said, don't sell. And if you do, don't ask for a penny less than five million. But uh, his brother Constantine was more insistent than ever that Rus the Russian Empire would be better off without Russian America. However, discussions got serious in 1867, and late on the night of March 29th, the Seward family was playing cards upstairs uh, when Russia's ambassador, Edward de Steckel, served in the country for many years, married a Boston girl, dropped by and told Seward he'd just received approval from the Tsar for the sale by telegram, the price now set at Okay, you're all eligible for PFDs. And uh, Steckel said, well, I can come by your office tomorrow and we can do it then if you like. And Seward dropped his cards and shoved the table away and said, let's do it right now. And there's the picture. <laughs> um, that's what they did. They went to the State Department, they turned on the lights, and they worked through the middle of the night. Uh, this is the uh, Lights picture that uh, uh, Cole will talk more about when he gets here. The same guy who did the painting of Washington crossing the Delaware and was mainly famous for his historical paintings did this. The original usually hangs above the dining room table at the Seward House Museum. It's a little hard to see because it's high and it's across this giant luxury dining set. Right now it's at the Anchorage Museum at eye level and you can get right up nose to nose with these people. It's really kind of nice. It's also going to be in Juneau, I understand, in October at the State Museum there, where they have a full-size replica already, but this was the original. Uh, we have uh, Seward's uh, secretary, um, 
behind him. They're sort of seated for some reason. And then we have the two translators working on French, Russian, and English translations at the same time to get it all together. It had to be in French. That was the international diplomatic language. Um, De Stecco pointing to, yep, right here, 7.2, all yours. Uh, Charles Sumner, the senator from Massachusetts, is sitting there. He really wasn't in the room, but he'd been informed this was happening. And then Seward's son, Frederick, his skull all mitted up from having been bashed in. Um, as, as the dawn rose, the document was finished. Seward ran it over to the White House, woke up Andrew Johnson, who signed it, and then he ran it over to the Senate, which was just about to adjourn for the session and walked in and said, a treaty for the session of Russian America, and everybody gasped. Everyone except Charles Sumner. Um, a few days later, he, he suggested, let's get back together, boys. Let's not leave town. Get back together in three days for a special session, and we'll talk about this. And he gave a three-hour speech on the floor of the Senate, which then ratified the treaty 37 to 2. It would take more than a year for the House to appropriate the funds, but as far as Seward was concerned, it was a done deal. He rushed the news to the local press, and with the speed of the transatlantic cable, it was picked up by the European newspapers. And from there, the Russian people finally found out about it from foreigners. The Russian people were not happy. Um, one admiral was cashiered for objecting too loudly. The editorials were so scathing that Alexander had to threaten publishers with charges of sedition if they kept it up. De Steckel, who'd been getting a big, expecting a big promotion, was instead uh, pensioned off, sent to France. A century later, American historian um, Hector Chevigny said he could find no reference to Steckel in Russian history books. The Russian historian Edvard Radzinski puts it this way, the sale of Alaska is the one act for which Russians have still not forgiven Alexander II. For bonus points, the dog's name is Milord. It's in every picture um, uh, of him that was painted or taken during this time. So why did Alexander do it? We don't know. There was no press release from the uh, Russian Foreign Ministry. But the prevailing theory points to the vulnerability of the colony. It's not often noted, but there was a Pacific front to the Crimean War. A joint British-French fleet attacked Petropavlovsk with over, on the Kamchatka Peninsula with overwhelming force. They were driven back however, and retreated to Victoria, British Columbia. But had the fleet turned north, it would have taken Kodiak and Sitka without firing a shot, and would all be either speaking British or French. To put it in perspective, love the big map with Alaska in the middle. Um, over there in the Black Sea, we have the Crimean Peninsula, where all the major action took place. There was also action in the Arctic Sea, up there off the Arctic Ocean, or the White Sea. And there was action in the Baltic Sea, where the Allies were proceeding towards uh, St. Petersburg before the Finns actually turned them back, again, over overwhelming force. The big loss they had actually was there in Sevastopol. Here is Petropavlovsk on the Kamchatka Peninsula, all the way over in the Pacific Ocean. There's Victoria in Canada. And you can see how close Alaska was to the Crimean War. This is something you don't run into in American history books, by the way. Um, the British don't like their English language history books about the Crimean War. They don't like to be reminded they lost a battle. The Russians are all over it. Um, and then nine years after the Crimean War, a Confederate raider, the Shenandoah, sank the Yankee whaling fleet in the Bering Sea just a couple months after Appomattox. News traveled slowly. The rebels fired the final shot of the Civil War and set fire to a fortune in whale oil. Now, if a single light warship could do that much damage, what might a real Navy do to Russian waters? And why did America want it? Well, for one thing, Seward was convinced that sooner or later the U.S. and Canada would be one big, happy country. And having Alaska in the portfolio would sort of complete the set. Also, he saw the advantage of trade with Asia via the Great Circle Route, the shortest distance between Japan and San Francisco. It's shown on this map, which was issued uh, just a couple of months after Sumner's speech. It's the first map that has Alaska indicating the entire region. And it shows the Great Circle Route in that inset up there as a straight line between, France, uh, uh, between uh, San Francisco and Nagasaki, I think. In fact, it actually runs a little north of that. It, the, the Great Circle Route cuts north of the Aleutian Islands and comes back down south through it there. It's an international waterway. And uh, 
nowadays about 4,000 foreign flag visit, uh, vessels every year uh, take it. Alaskans aren't very aware of that either. Um, now, if it sounds like Seward was in a great rush to stay up all night and get this thing done right then and there, he was. And the reason was, he saw the window of opportunity closing fast. Congress was mad at President Johnson, and Johnson was mad at them. In the next year, Johnson was impeached by the House of Representatives. Seward arranged for his defense, and, went, and the Senate ultimately fell one vote short of removing Johnson from office. Then Seward, who had helped create the Republican Party, became reviled by his fellow Republicans for taking the side of a Democrat, Johnson. Why did he do it? Well, because he first of all felt the grounds for impeachment were unconstitutional. And also he had seen what happened in Central and South American republics when one branch of government usurped the rights of another, how it led to chaos and dictatorships and coups and more civil wars, which he really wanted to avoid. In May, right after, a couple months after selling Alaska, <laughs> um, Alexander went to Paris, ostensibly to see the great international exhibition that was there, but really to visit his secret wife, this sweet young thing named Ekaterina Dolgoruski. Um, she bore him three children ultimately, and on the death of Tsarina Maria became his official wife. And while he was there taking a carriage ride with Emperor Napoleon III, a Polish exile ran up to the carriage with a pistol and fired two shots both of which missed. Davis could only wish for that kind of excitement. At the end of the Civil War, he was made the military governor of Kentucky. He built hospitals for the freemen and schools for their children. He overruled Kentucky laws that did things like forbid a black man's testimony to be accepted in a court of law. And he suppressed the regulators, which were kind of a Kentucky version of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, but it was all bureaucratic stuff. and he. Um, thrilled with it. What he really wanted to do was join his old command out west in hot battles with the engines. So he was thrilled when he got new orders in an envelope. But when he opened the envelope it read, you are to assume the duties of the governor of the military district of Alaska. Alaska. This is the only picture I could find of Davis in Sitka by the way. Uh, he may have been thought that he was being punished for killing Bull Nelson, or maybe Stanton was getting back at him for the Ebenezer Creek business. But he was um, a man of duty, so he shipped out and took command of Alaska to ceremony in Sitka on October 18, 1867. He had his hands full. He'd come off the boat with more than 200 troops, which was by far the largest professional military force that Alaska had ever seen. And they all needed housing. Russian civilians living in government property were all evicted and left with no place to go. Most returned to the motherland in disgust. A group of opportunistic Americans, certain that they were on the forefront of the next San Francisco, arrived and formed their own city government. They proceeded to act like they were in charge. The complaints of everyone came to Davis's desk, and as if he didn't have enough to worry about, the U.S. Army decided to send its worst convicts to Sitka to be work crews. <laughs> Stay, <yeah. laughs> Yeah, he kept a close eye on, on the Tlingit population, but they weren't the kind of Indians he was expecting. He said he was very impressed by their industry, their intelligence, and above all, by their respect for the law. I love this picture. This is by Edward Moybridge, a uh, famous photographer who did the running horses pictures in a series that are considered to be the start of moving picture photography. Uh, he was up here in 1868, and usually he liked to pose his photographs and even make stuff up. This looks like a candid photograph. He came around the corner trying to get a good picture of that ship. And here are these people sitting on the beach. Maybe they had a picnic, come back for a celebration of some sort, maybe a marriage. The guy's got a ribbon in his hair. Uh, but clearly, a, a kind of an ethnically mixed group here, relaxing on a probably pretty nice day in either Wrangell or Fort, uh, Fort Tongass. I'm not quite sure which there. And um, the Indians also had a certain respect for him. Herb Hope told me that early on, a Clinket, a Russian, and a blue coat American soldier were all thrown in the same cell on the same day for the same crime, drunken and disorderly conduct, like what else? And um, he said, this story spread through the village like wildfire. The idea that the soldiers themselves were subject to punishment. The Russians hadn't always been. Uh, in another case, soldiers looted St. Michael's Cathedral. 
Davis had them court-martialed and drummed out of the service in a humiliating public spectacle, stripped of their buttons and so forth, and shipped out, told never to come back. It was all very impressive. Nonetheless, his own troops were Davis's biggest headache while he was here. They were idle, they were bored, they tended to find bootleg booze and get into trouble. Some of the same men who had just fought the war to end slavery bought Indian children to be their slaves. Davis made them give the children back, but his orders hadn't said anything about slavery between Indians, so he didn't interfere with that, although he did stop the practice of killing slaves at important uh, events like the, uh, death, uh, the death of a chief and things like that. In 1868, Kochluk came to Sitka with several warriors. Chiefs and delegations from Wrangell, Cake, and elsewhere were also in town, and there was a lot of business to be discussed. I keep trying to imagine the guy in white might be Kochluk. However, this is another Moybridge photo. These could just be soldiers dressed up and told to stand there. But the caption does say, Distinguished Chiefs in Sitka, Alaska. Um, As many as 1,200 Clinkets lived in Sitka. The Indian town um, uh, had, a, had a, a palisade around it, uh, a fence basically, and a gate. Um, Davis put a sentry at the gate and he imposed a curfew, which is similar to what he would have been doing in Kentucky, by the way. On New Year's Day, Kochluk and some friends returned to town after curfew. The sentry challenged him. Kochluk snatched his rifle and walked off laughing. Davis sent soldiers into the village to bring back Kochluks and the rifle. A crowd gathered, shots were exchanged, at least one man was killed, and the soldiers retreated to the castles in terror, prepared for a full-blown uprising. The next morning, um, we lost our card. Ah. The next morning, Davis um, called all the leaders of the village up to the castle and showed them his cannons pointed at their homes. Davis said he'd fire if they didn't turn over Kochluks. Well, we can't do that, they said. We don't want to fight the Chilkats any more than we want to fight you. We'll put white flags over our houses. That's how you people do it, right? Throughout the day, Davis paced back and forth against, uh, in front of the, behind the cannons, which were all loaded, ready to fire, and he kept muttering, I can't kill all those people for just one man. But no one would go into the village to try and take Kochluks. So finally, as his terrified soldiers looked on, he walked into Indian town alone, to the door of the house where he knew Kochluk was staying, knocked on the door, and put him under arrest. And the Sitka people, true to their white flags, stood by and let the Chilkat leader be taken off to jail. At that point, he installed a travel ban until the situation might calm down, but some cake men tried to leave by sea and they were fired on. One was shot. On their way back home, the survivors found two white prospectors and killed them in blood retribution. In response, Davis burned cake to the ground. The cake people had some warning and they got out, but it was lean times until spring. Modern historians are pretty unanimous that Davis overreacted in the so-called cake war, but a full investigation by the U.S. Army exonerated him. Um, everyone was still on edge when an astronomer with the U.S. Coastal Survey approached Davis with an unusual request. He said, there's going to be a full eclipse of the sun in August, and Cluck One would be the perfect place for me to observe it. Is it safe to go there? Davis went to see Kochluks. He offered him his freedom if he could guarantee the safety of the white men coming to see the eclipse. Kochluks, who Herb Hopes suggested might have been spending his time in the pokey gathering a lot of intelligence information, uh, agreed. And as he was heading back to Cluck One, General Grant was heading to the White House as the new President of the United States and bringing his own administration with him. Seward left the post of Secretary of State, which he'd held for eight years, and went back to Auburn, but he couldn't stay still. In May of that year, 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad, a project that Seward had advocated for 20 years, was finally completed. He became one of the first passengers, and when he arrived in San Francisco, he received a hero's welcome. People followed his carriage in the streets, cheering. The big money men all fought to entertain him. The Chinese American Society paid a call and the government of Mexico invited him to make a state visit. He was offered a beautiful yacht, the Active, for a voyage to Alaska, and he took him up on that. In Sitka, he toured the tannery, the ice house, the brewery. He went to church at both St. Michael's and the Finnish Lutheran Church, and he spent a lot of time and money in the Clinkett town. 
where there was already a big tourist shop industry up and running, almost as if they could see the future. He sent home crates of masks, baskets, carvings, weavings, and even a live bald eagle. And of course, he jumped at the chance to go see an eclipse. In Cluck One, Kochluk set up a special cabin for him. And Cluck One is the only place in Alaska where Seward actually spent a night ashore. On August 5th, the skies cleared just in time for the eclipse. The observation was a great success, and a cheerful mood settled on the observers. Kochluk then invited everyone to his house, the famous whale house seen in these well-known uh, postcard photos from about uh, the 1890s. Um, and the, with these incredible house posts that are still on display in Cluck One at the Jilkat Cultural Center. And put it on your bucket list. I am not joking. They are sensational. Um, inside the so-called big house of Kochluk, or the whale house, Seward and Davis found themselves surrounded by hundreds of very solemn clinket in full regalia. Coach Lux explained the murders of his, uh, of his people by the sick of people and asked Seward, what are you going to do about it, big man? And what unfolded was a match between two master negotiators. In the end, the Chilcats accepted 36 blankets as recompense, and this made everybody happy. The Chilcats and the Sitka people, who both had relatives they hadn't been able to visit for years, and Davis, who had one less thing to worry about, and Seward, who invited everyone to join him for one of his fabulous parties aboard the Active. Everyone who was anyone in Cluck One showed up and made it to the boat, and the whites were astonished when Kochluk showed up to dine wearing what Frederick called an impeccable black suit. I used this photo when I mentioned Kochluk, but it's not him. It was taken five or ten years after his death, one of the series from that postcard, of those postcards. Everyone else in the series is wearing traditional robes, hats, and so forth. But why is this one man in this one photo wearing a black suit? and in a style from about 40 years before the picture was taken. This is total hypothesis, but I would submit that that is the suit Kochluk wore when he met Seward. Um, there's precedent for this. If you go to the Seward House Museum, you'll see the suit that Seward wore when he met, met Queen Victoria, kept as a souvenir. Um, after three weeks in Alaska, Seward returned to California via Oregon. He made a long trip through Mexico and the Caribbean and got back to Auburn a year after he'd left, but he didn't stay long. In 1871, this is before Jules Verne's book came out, he took off on a trip around the world. He was in very bad physical shape, hardly able to move a spoon to his lips at this point. But he managed another railroad journey across the country to San Francisco and then a month-long steamship voyage to Japan, where he met the Mikado, then to China, Indonesia, India, the Middle East, Turkey, Europe, and finally back home across the Atlantic to Auburn. He was working on a, on a book about the adventure when he died on October 10, 1872, on the green couch there at the Auburn house. Jeff Davis was reassigned to California, where in 1873 he ended the California Indian Wars. Some of us refer to it as the California Genocide. Um, his health went into decline, but the Army kept him on the payroll until he died in Chicago in 1879. Disaster awaited Alexander. But with Alaska off his to do list, he planned for what he hoped would be his crowning achievement the unification of all Slavic peoples under his rule. Turkey ruled much of Eastern Europe in the 1870s. Slavs in the Balkans and Bulgaria revolted and were answered with atrocities the executions of whole villages, the impaling of babies, and that sort of thing. The Russian public was outraged and demanded that the Tsar take action. Alexander joined his troops in the field. They stalled at the Turkish garrison of Plevna, Bulgaria. The battle took tens of thousands of Russian lives before the Turks were finally starved out. Alexander was able to ride into the capital of Sofia, Bulgaria, without firing a shot. There's the statue to him in, so in uh, Sofia, where he is still known as Alexander the Liberator. The Turks, on the other hand, who were about half the population, uh, fled in a chaotic exodus. Alexander's troops steamrolled towards Constantinople and got within 12 miles. The generals begged him to let him take the city, but his diplomats uh, wanted him to hold, ah, well, we'll settle all this at the negotiating table, they said. Well, at the negotiating table, all of Europe piled on, grabbing at pieces of the pie that had been abandoned by Turkey. Bulgaria got its independence. Austria got a hunk of the Balkans, setting the stage for World War I. Russia got relatively little. 
The public was frustrated and bitter that so many lives had been lost for such insignificant gains. A rebellious mood set in. A secret group that called itself People's Will preached that the only way to move forward was to kill the Tsar. A campaign of terror ensued with the anarchists setting fires and attacking public officials, sometimes in broad daylight. There were other attempts to shoot Alexander, and then a train thought to be carrying him was blown up with dynamite, and then another bomb went off inside the Winter Palace. Alexander's response was an all-out war on terror. The secret police arrested people left and right. Civil rights and freedom of the press were rescinded. The country was placed under military law. But the turmoil continued everywhere, everywhere except for Kharkov in the Ukraine. The military governor of Kharkov was this man, Mikhail Loris Melikov, an Armenian veteran of the Caucasus Wars who had an almost supernatural ability to enforce strict rules while charming the population. Alexander had him take over the war on terror. The terrorists were good at making bombs, but not so good at covering their tracks, and Loris Melikov was able to round up almost all of them. Almost all. A handful, literally five people, led by this woman, Sofia Perovskaya, remained at large and under the radar. But with the main leaders rounded up, Loris Melikov advised the Tsar to restore civil rights and meet whatever demands he could. Alexander agreed, and soon enough, things calmed down. Alexander then began work on what truly would have been his crowning achievement, a constitution, Russia's first, allowing for elections, making the Tsar a constitutional monarch. The document was completed, and Alexander planned to make it law in early March of 1881. On March 1st, he was riding in an armored carriage. Um, one bomb was hurled at the carriage, killing a bystander and a guard. Alexander got out to help the wounded, and at that, a second man, through a second bomb. That one killed him. Under his successor, Alexander III, the reforms were reversed. The persecution of Jews resumed. There would be no constitution. This church stands on the spot in St. Petersburg where Alexander was attacked. It's called the Cathedral on Spilled Blood. Put it on your bucket list. Kofluk became known as a peacemaker. He was one of the leaders who helped locate the site for the Presbyterian mission in Haines in the late 1870s. He himself remained a pagan of pagans, as the missionaries called him. They did not like him. But he acknowledged that his people wanted the education and the jobs that they thought the mission might bring. When John Muir, the naturalist, met him, the old chief wore a mind-bogglingly expensive chinchilla cloak. It had a tag on it that read, to Chartridge from his friend, William Seward. This is Kochuk's grave in Klukwan. He walked into the woods in 1889, as I think he would like us to say, a few years after he had finally freed his own slaves. He was likely the last rich man on this continent to do so, and that was the real end of private slavery in America. And this is the real end of my talk. So, oh, look at that. And take the exit. Oh, not quite the end of the talk. Um, the, the books, by the way, are available at Old Harbor. I also brought some copies here. Um, so um, if you want to buy them, I'll be glad to sign them uh, tonight. There is a friendly, fa family and friends discount of $2 for buying them both. So uh, keep that in mind. My publisher lets me do that. Um, but like I said, Old Harbor has them and can order more. Alexander has been outselling Seward. I don't know why, except I think there's kind of a monarchist fringe out there somewhere that wants to know more about things. Anyway, uh, that's as much as I know. Well, not, not as much as I know, but it's about as much as I'm, you're ready to hear. <laughs> How's that? Yeah, I'm, I, uh, 6.30 tomorrow at, at Old Harbor, I'll be signing books there as well. So um, that's there. Yeah. Yes, there are a couple of them. Um, the Russian expansion to the coast of Siberia, I mean, the, 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 there was some problem in the, in the 1600s, a big kind of fighting between the Chinese and the Russians along the Amur River, which goes all the way from Irkutsk to the coast somewhere, 3,000 miles long. 
the treaty said, we'll both stay out, which they basically did. The Chinese, in fact, removed all of their citizens from the region, lest they become infected by non-Chinese thinking. Um, so it was vacant. And in about eight, about, at the same time as the Crimean War, the governor of Siberia, which was everything east of Irkutsk, said, this river looks navigable. He built steamships and took a fleet of 70 barges down the river um, to, to find, find the mouths. Um, before he could do that, though, he had to know that the mouth was somehow or other navigable once you got there. The word was sent to Sitka to send a ship over to see if they could find the mouths of the, of the river. The, the sailors disguised themselves as Americans and the boat as American. In case they ran into any Chinese, it would be the Americans' fault. Uh, but they didn't run into any Chinese. They found the mouths of the river. They got word back, and they, they, the expedition was completed, and the, the construction of Nikolaevsk and then Vladivostok began with help from sit settlers from Sitka. He actually called settlers back over from Sitka to help me establish uh, this, this land here. And then on the way back up the river, he stopped by the one Chinese garrison who were astonished to see Russians and said, we've got to renegotiate this treaty. We're out of war, and we have to... We have to get a free passage to the, to the Pacific to protect ourselves against the British. And the Chinese had just been beaten in the over, opium wars. They were happy to do anything that made the British unhappy. So that's the result, is that the Amur River is now the, the border between, um, between China and Russia. My eyes aren't too good. I should put on glasses. OK. I, Here's one of the things that, as I worked on the book and found out more about these guys, Kochluk and Seward were kind of similar personalities. Um, they, they both were, first of all, convinced of their own intelligence and, uh, uh, you know, that, that, they were, that they were kind of responsible for more than just themselves. And they were after, for power, for a way to kind of help people. Seward was very big on this. I mean, and they both loved to entertain. <laughs> They loved to entertain. They were both politicians of the highest order, but most of all, they were the kind of men, if you walked into the room within 15 seconds, they would know exactly why you were there and what you really wanted. And we, we've all met people like this. Often they become politicians. Not always, but, you know, successful business people. Uh, they exist out there. And it's interesting, the main, the main, um, the main written history of the meeting is from Frederick Seward, who did not have his father's gifts of... Uh, grasping intellectual things, I think. Uh, and he, he sort of tells the story clumsily, and, and you get the feeling that, uh, that Seward was looking at it somewhat differently. He took it very, the negotiation quite seriously. He understood that what Coach Lux was looking for was respect more than anything else. And he had no power as an official, elected official anymore, but he could certainly offer his services to kind of sort out this, this business here. And, um, and you know, it was... It was you know, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating meeting. It's, uh, the book of Coach Luke's life still needs to be written. It won't be written by me. Um, I met at least one of his relatives who said, she's working on one and has all kinds of things, but it, it'll be interesting to see how that, uh, how, that, how, that, how that comes out. There are a lot of great books that could be written about it. One thing Sitka could do is put up little signs of where Seward was when he was here. Um, I, I think this was all in the ocean at that time, this particular piece here, but uh, he talked to the Chamber of Commerce. I talked to the Chamber of Commerce today. Is that kind of the same location? I don't know. Um, that, would, that would be kind of interesting, but actually a book just about his adventure in Alaska has not been written, and his travels through Mexico, which are sensational, um, are also not really written about, but it'd be interesting to me to go to Mexico and find out if they still remember him with the uh, awe that they held him in in 1869. They loved the man. He'd, he'd, you know, he was, America was the only place that kind of stood up for the uh, nationalist regime when the French tried to take over. And even though we were fighting our own war, they were very grateful that we didn't interfere. And uh, they, they considered Seward to be a national hero. Um, but yeah, he, he, had, he had some pretty sensational gifts. Uh, just he was, he was a very smart man. And uh, he also was, I think, kind of sympathetic to other people in a very egalitarian way. I don't think it's because he considered everyone to be his equal, but because he felt himself to be a little superior to everyone else. So um, everyone else was more or less equal. But women and blacks and the insane, people like that deserved rights too, was his idea. Yeah. 
I understand there's one in Ketchikan, a recent one. I have not seen it. Could you repeat the question? Oh, uh, the, the question was about um, about a ridicule poll for sick for a Seward, and I believe there's one in Ketchikan. The story I've heard was that he didn't reciprocate Coach Lux's potlatch, and therefore he deserves to be ridiculed. I don't know that that was a real potlatch. If I understand potlatches, they're very ceremonial. They have to have some kind of greater. So in Western Alaska, certainly that's that's the way it would be. Someone had to be named. There should have been dancing. Um, Frederick mentions no dancing at the, at the entire event. This was, this was kind of a business meeting as much as anything else. But once again, that remains for other people to, to uh, dig up and find out more about. I think there's stuff out there. I'm always amazed to run into Coach Lux or Chartridge's name when I go through uh, old books. He was a figure here for a considerable period of time and um, just keeps popping up over and over again in these remarkable circumstances. Yeah. Seward said that, that buying Alaska was the greatest thing he ever did in his entire life. Um, I think historians would take issue with that. I think they would say saving the Union, saving America three times or more during the Civil War era was probably, probably a little greater than that. But, you know, historians love to think, what if, you know, just a few seconds, what if Alexander had not gotten out of that carriage? and Russia had a constitution. Would we even hear the name of Lenin or Stalin nowadays? Um, what if Lewis Powell's gun had been the gun that worked and John Wilkes Booth gun had been the one that didn't? If Seward had died and Lincoln had lived? Well, I think we can say that the reunion of the North and South would have gone a lot more smoothly. Lincoln had a special plan for how he wanted the country to come back together and he was a good enough politician to pull it off without making Congress mad at him. Uh, the whole country was in awe of the guy. But if Seward had died, I don't think, I don't think um, Alaska would be part of the United States. Um, it was his very quick action on the night of the March 29th that made it happen. If he had delayed even one day, like the Russian ambassador suggested, the Senate would have been out, out of town. You could not have rounded these guys back up until August or September, by which point they were at the, uh, the whole administration had erupted into this big dispute, uh, this big fight, and no one was going to vote for anything Andrew Johnson brought to them. Um, and he, he got it through just in the nick of time. It was um, you know, kind of remarkable there. But also, if Seward had not been Secretary of State when he was, if Britain had declared war on the United States, it's real possible that the North would not have won, and that we would have a very different organization in what we now call the Lower 48, which raises other questions. Would we have then been able to have the power that we brought to World War I and II if we had not been a united country? Um, people sometimes talk about the purchase of Alaska. Was it worth the money? Was it worth the sale to the Russians? Well, I'd submit that in about 48 hours of the Battle of Stalingrad, the exchange paid for itself. Uh, where Russia had air support, that probably wouldn't have been possible without the American involvement uh, in Alaska that set up the lend -Lease program that got them planes to fight the German planes, which otherwise would have destroyed the Russian ground forces. That, that's all. That's all. I, I, I spent time at the end of each book kind of saying, what if, what if? And, uh, but that, that, that's a historian's hobby. It has nothing to do with reality. You know. uh, yes, sir? What happened to the Russian flag that comes down with the battle of the <clears throat> I don't know where that thing wound up. I imagine it was, it was uh, folded ceremoniously and taken back to Russia on the ship that took the, um, probably left with the Russian governor. Or it could have left even earlier, but I think it probably went with the last governor. International banking was set up and running very well. Um, he had accounts, not only in the United States, <laughs> But in Europe, in various various accounts, and it was it was I mean it wasn't like they loaded up trunks of gold and sent it around. It was pieces of paper saying, you know, the state of Russia has this much in gold in this bank and this much in gold in this bank, and you can draw on it at any time you may need it. Um, it, it was yeah, so it was it was all all done on paper. Um, but the check, by the way, is on display also at the Anchorage Museum right now. And there's an interesting side story that goes with that. The signature on the check, which is almost unreadable, is by a man named Francis Spinner, who was the treasurer of the United States. 
and who worked on that signature to make it unforgeable. He was very proud of his signature. And it was the first paper currency issued by the federal government. It had Lincoln's face on the $5 bill, which is still there. It had Spinner's own face on the 50 cent bill, which we had back then. And they were all had his signature. It was the most famous signature in the country for about 20 years. He's also the first federal official to hire women into the government. He said, we've got a lot of men sitting around counting the pennies and dimes that people are sending in for their taxes. They could be better used on the battlefield. Women can count money as well as men. He insisted on hiring women. He insisted on paying them the same as his male employees. And when, I think it's like the Harrison administration came in and said, uh, we'll take over the hiring of your employees, he quit. He wouldn't allow them to, uh, to do that. His employees later set up a nice statue for him in Herkimer, New York. And across the river in his hometown of Mohawk is his tomb, which I have seen. It's about the size of this screen, a giant granite block, uh, just a, like a big shoebox that size, with only one thing on it, his signature. <laughs> That's the only thing on the whole thing. But yeah, uh, uh, Francis Spinner, a uh, fascinating character on, on his own right, but uh, the man who wrote the check. He actually signed it, had to sign it front and back because endorsed when it came back. Yes? Uh, uh, well, in Cluck One, they told me Koshuk, um, with a little bit of a at the end. Um, and then um, uh, family members in Juneau and Ketchikan were saying Koshuk, like, almost like a, a raven in cold weather. <laughs> yeah, Shot Ridge, Chart Ridge. There is actually a document that I've read that it's about three pages long and it lists the various names he was known by and where they show up in, in the literature. There's, um, um, uh, he was quite famous, but his, he was, had several names that, that he used at different times. The, the Shotridge name, or Chartridge, um, it comes from a clinket word, something like Charterich, which I understand means never hit a, never hit a shark on the head. And I thought about that for a minute, and you know, you get dogfish or the sharks, and, and sharks aren't like humans or salmon. They really don't have brains in between their, whatever their ears are. Uh, their whole body is their nervous system. You hit them on the head, they're just going to get mad. They're not going to be stunned at all. Um, so one of his uncles gave him the name when he was like, you know, two weeks old, and it stuck. <laughs> That's the story I've heard. Um, but yeah, many names. So anyway, yes. Well, Kokuk was the way that the way that the way, yeah. And it, you're, you're kidding me. Um, you know, I don't, I'd really like to know uh, how Seward said it when he when he made it he included in the speech. I, I went to Rochester, New York, where his papers are kept, and some through the papers, and I found this kind of long-hand document he wrote, apparently on the boat, that he, of the speech he was going to give to. Um, the Seward Chamber of Commerce when he got, a uh, Chamber of Commerce when he got back here. And um, a lot of it got thrown out, but what got inserted at some point there, he refers to uh, Chartridge as being a very smart man who had given him much information about what was, what was in the interior. It's the only proper name he actually mentions in the entire speech. So he seems to have been struck. One of the things that strikes an Alaskan is that I can't find an instance where William Henry Seward even spoke or met a Native American until his trip up here. Um, they kind of disappeared from upper New York State and um, didn't disappear, they were sent to Minnesota. Um, and and um, he's making the trip up and the first time you, he, he actually meets people are the Haida, where he's entertained by the Queen of the Haida, no name given. Um, but with a, that was, that was a, quite a ceremony there. They did have dancing, they had feasting, and the eagle feathers, everyone was doused with the eagle feathers, he, or, uh, the down, he points that out. They were, they had those, uh, and then on here in Sitka here, where he probably met quite a few clans, uh, they were at all the dinner parties that Davis was throwing for him, and uh, all the important people were there, so was the bishop. Uh, everyone wanted to see Seward. They all thought he still had some political power, when in fact, he didn't anymore. He was a disgraced man back in Washington, D.C. So to come to San Francisco and be greeted as a hero, he, he thought that was wonderful. He's the type of person, I, I, I often wonder about him. They had to take him in a, I think it was actually uh, one, one of the 
dug dugouts that he got from the active to the shore on. And what happens when this old kind of crippled man gets off the boat and looks out there and hear all these people staring at him? This is what he did. <laughs> he was a politician. He just <laughs> he wanted, wanted people like he was. Uh, he was a very good politician. He could, he could, but he did have principles that he wouldn't go back on. What got him in trouble with the Johnson administration? It probably his his stand on immigration probably cost him his nomination as the as the presidential candidate, which may have cost him the, the election as well. But he was uh, he and Lincoln saw it the same way. But Lincoln just hadn't opened his mouth about it. Anyway, thank you very much for, for all coming out. And um, I just want to say it's been a great pleasure to come to, to, come to Sitka after 50 years and, and see the place again. It's just, just a lovely town to walk around in. When I was very, very young, Anchorage, too, was a walking town, and it definitely isn't now. Um, so I, I enjoy, enjoyed that a great deal. The idea that I can walk to the airport is something that doesn't even exist back in, in Quinhawk anymore. The airport's like three, four miles out of town. I don't know who thought that one up, but um, it's not like we have taxi service out there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. And.